Hey, what's up? What's up, everybody? How's it going? It's Zeke. It's Zeke. Okay. I'm going to put the papers. Yesterday, I went to Horton's Holiday Hayride, which was uh, Reverend Horton Heat's um, holiday, you know, concert deal. And uh, Dave Alvin from the Blasters was there. It was great. So uh, it was right down the street from my house. Really great. So 30 bucks at the door, or you could, which is weird because you could buy pre sale tickets and it would be like $37 after the fees and all this other bullshit. Uh, 30 bucks at the door. All right. So uh, the five, six, seven, eights were the, the opening act there. This like Japanese girl uh, surf rock group that was in a Quint Quentin Tarantino movie. I can't remember which one. Uh, <coughs> then the Boot Glow Skulls were on after them. And, you know, they're like a um, California Mexican American band that's been around for a long time, ska band that has this, like, real, like, uh, great horn section. You know, these, like, horn players, like a trumpet player and a saxophone player, though, it's all this energy and stuff. Some of the songs in Spanish. So that was great. That was also fantastic. We sit at the bar, get a nice craft brew, places like this old, um, Renovated Armory. It was killer in Hampton, uh, Virginia. Very nice. Really close to me. It was really, it was really nice. So I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, then uh, Dave Alvin came out with Reverend Horton Heat, and Reverend Horton Heat had this piano player who was like, was like a Jerry Lee Lewis kind of active. Really like would get up and jump around and stand on the piano and all this kind of stuff. Did all these Christmas songs. It was like a real schmaltzy kind of. Um, 60s kitsch kind of Christmas show on stage. There's all kinds of like tinsel, tinfoil like shit, you know, trees and stuff, Christmas trees and shit. You know, Santa Claus and all that kind of stuff. It was great. And uh, it was just great. It was just fantastic in general. Really loved it. It was a really nice Christmas show. And I actually saw David Allen Coe there uh, recently too. I think I've talked about that in a video. I don't even remember. I haven't made a video in a couple weeks because I made a video that was about like you know, some record, like 10, give me 10 kind of video. Anyway, I didn't, I don't think I've talked about my stuff that I got in a uh, record store day. I don't know if I did or not, I don't remember. This is like a hip hop record called Eden, Beauty and the Beast from 2005 that has this like psychedelic sampling and all this kind of great stuff. Really brilliant hip hop record. And I'm kind of getting more into hip hop records now. I'm kind of getting more into thinking about buying hip hop records that I could have been buying back then. That I kind of didn't. I kind of let some stuff go that I kind of wish I hadn't, you know, but that's all right. It happens, you know. It happens. Uh, I'm trying to remember what all I got. Um, I don't remember what I showed. I'll tell you one thing that I bought at a Goodwill at, that I had listened to and, and really thought very highly of was this is Philip Roebuck the Alpine Butterfly this guy's a local Norfolk Virginia thing and it's like a husband and wife duo kind of like a shovels and rope kind of duo you know like like a real like stomp and kick and guitar like acoustic kind of act you know like a dog a dog house bass and acoustic guitar or something it was it was good it's, I really like that a lot um what am I thinking of Got this record. Bob Martin, Midwest Farm Disaster. So, th this is like from 1970 on RCA Victor. And the guy kind of plays like, almost like a like a Jim Croce or a, I don't know what. Um, he kind of plays like, uh, James Taylor, like really competent kind of like 70s singer-songwriter kind of player, but then his voice kind of sounds like Joe Walsh. I think this is excellent. Midwest Farm Disaster. Uh, I really like this a lot. There's some great songs. Kind of some of them are kind of sad, like um, what is the Mill Town is the third track on side one. That's a really sad song, but there's some good stuff in here but his voice is a little bit like Joe Walsh is what it, what it reminds me the guy's actually a Boston folky but you know I thought he was like from Michigan or something because I don't know just the, the accent but this was actually recorded in Nashville you know RCA so early 70s RCA I don't remember if I talked about some of this stuff or not I got this on record store day Black Friday um Freddie King's the mojo 
this was all like outtakes, but really, I mean, just it's unissued kind of stuff, but really it sounds exactly like a Freddie King record, you know? Not seeing any comments, so if you guys are out there, you know, say hello, because I can't see it. So this it's kind of does this to me sometimes. I hate this about YouTube. I'm sorry, I was watching Aaron's video and he was kind of doing this same thing, so I'm not sure what's up. Hey, what's up, Jens? How are you? I can see you now. Sorry, I don't know what, what happened there. What's going on? How are you? You getting ready for Christmas? I don't know, y'all celebrate Christmas over there? Some people do, some don't, I don't know. There's a guy at work, he was like, I don't celebrate Christmas. I don't give gifts and all that garbage. And I'm like, well, fucking sorry. Excuse me, bro. All I was doing was making some small talk. Then my man, Mellow Candle, 1970. Uh, swaddling songs. This is a reissue. The originals are like worth big, big money. This is a really good record, man. I, I kind of get in the vibe that I already talked about this because I don't even can't remember. It feels like forever since I made a video. I can't remember what I talked about or not. Um, I've been listening to some country, a lot of country, Jens. Jens, I don't know if you know this album. Going home to your parents. Oh, you had to leave now. Yeah, no worry, man. Hey, yeah, well, yeah, have fun, man. No worries. Tell them all I said hello. You guys have a good time. Josh Graves, same old blues. Even though Jens is uh, no longer with us in the live chat, I'm probably going to go ahead and keep showing some country records for Jens because <laughs> Jens loves country records as much as I do. <coughs> and I know a lot of guys, Peter and, and uh, Headley, and I know a lot of you guys love country stuff. I do. I love it, you know. Gets a bad rap. Here comes the country records. Oh, man, John. John was just commenting. He's like, what are you talking about? It's like all fucking country now. He's like, the, the VC has become the the virtual country channel or something. I don't know what. Hey, I just showed a hip-hop record, man. Unusual for me. I just showed this record. I know you probably know this record, John. Eden, Beauty and the Beat. I really love this. I'm super into this. You know what I've been getting into a lot lately is the Neptunes and Nerd because because I play with Chad Hugo's brother, Victor Hugo, and, you know, and uh, you picked this up. Oh, I, I bet you would pick this up. Yeah, this is, I really like this, especially if you like psychedelic stuff, like, as much as I do. You know, I I love hip-hop. I really love hip-hop. The problem with hip-hop is hip-hop went through this whole period. <sighs> hip-hop went through this period in the late 90s and early 2000s that was really, like, Leany and kind of like like the whole uh, Master P shit and all that stuff. The real retrograde, like ignorant stuff, man. I really don't get into all that shit. I really never liked it. I, I, I always thought it was ridiculous. I mean, I even knew some of those guys and I was like, dude, you're not from the fucking projects. Like you weren't in a gang. You're from you're from the fucking middle class, man. But OK, whatever. If you were trying to get into that game, the time was kind of hard. You had to act like you were, you know, from the projects, from a gang in order to, like, be... Anyway. But that's not entirely true. I mean, like, you look at, like, the Neptunes and what they did with production and, you know, and a lot of that stuff. That, that's not retrograde at all. There's some great, great stuff there, you know. You're a farm boy from Kansas, Richard. Well, I'm a farm boy from Indiana, man. I'm, I'm, I'm a... But that being said, you know... <coughs> I mean, I listened to a very, very wide variety of things, and I was of the age, which I know I'm like, you know, 30 years younger than you, Richard, but I'm, uh, I'm of the age where we did listen to hip-hop tapes and stuff. We listened to N.W.A. So, you know, you love nerd. You know, I mean, they're great producers. Hey, hey, what's hey, what's going on? What's going on, Mike? Mikey Bananas, Richard, John. Been listening to some Christmas, classic Christmas albums. This is... Um, it says Dr. John, but really this is, a, um, I would say it's really a Huey Piano Smith Christmas album with all the, like, New Orleans kind of players on it, you know, um, Professor Longhair and that kind of stuff. Um, this is Huey Piano Smith and the Clowns with Dr. John. This is a very, very good Christmas album. I've been listening to a bunch of Christmas albums. I was listening to this. Let me see if I can find it. I was, well, anyway, I was listening to uh, uh, the Ella Fitzgerald Christmas album. I was listening to this. This is one of my 
all-time favorite Christmas albums, Kenny Burrell's Have Yourself a, a Soulful Little Christmas, the jazz guitar Christmas album. You scored a nice A&M Christmas compilation last week. Pretty stoked to play it. Oh, man. Yeah, I, I, you know, I love Christmas records. They get a bad rap. They get a very bad rap, but I think that there's some great, great stuff. This is a very tasteful Christmas album. Have Yourself a Soulful Little Christmas. I love jazz guitar Christmas albums, but... You know, and you know one that I kind of don't see people really talking about much, and I wouldn't really say this is jazz guitar, but it is a guitar Christmas album, is this Chet Atkins Christmas record. Now, Christmas with Chet Atkins. This is a wonderful Christmas album, you know. But last night I saw uh, Reverend Horton Heat, and he plays a, a Gretsch country gentleman like Chet Atkins, and um, Plays it quite well. Plays it very well, especially with Dave Alvin. Man, that was killer. Dave Alvin absolutely kicked my ass last night. I thought it was great. That reminded me of when I used to live in Texas, and you know, the, yeah, this is a classic. The Cret, the Chet Atkins Christmas album. You know, one thing about Christmas songs we've been listening to them at work is they can get too cloying really quickly. You know, it's like the vocalist Christmas songs and stuff. They can really get they can wear on your nerves because you you know. They're sh so schmaltzy, you know. Hey, Merry Christmas to all, Richard. Yeah, exactly. I think, uh, you know, there's something about Christmas that's really nostalgic and everything, and, and it's it, it's great, but there's there's a dark side, you know. <laughs> there's, there's a dark side to Christmas. Some people uh, have, you know, painful memories of Christmas and stuff and whatever, you know, so there's a lot of baggage, a lot of cultural baggage there. I was listening to this, too, Ella Fitzgerald's Christmas. Little Christmas go uh, music goes a long way, you know. It goes a long, long way. I have a lot of Christmas records. You st well, hey, thanks for stopping in, Ben. Thanks for stopping in. Happy holidays, man. You know, one thing I don't have a lot of is metal Christmas albums. And I, I would love... I wish Metallica would drop a, a, a Christmas album or something. I know they would just get absolutely lambasted for that. But fuck, I'd buy that shit. I would love to hear that, you know. Ella Fitzgerald's Christmas. To me, this is really not, like, like, there's something really overtly commercial about Mar the way Mariah Carey, for instance, sings, like, a Christmas song. Just really show busy, just like, I'm gonna make a million fucking dollars on this song, you know? And Ella Fitzgerald's kind of not like that, you know? They're, I, I, I would be very interested. To, I mean, if they'll make an album with Lou Reed, they'll make a Christmas album, right? One thing I don't have, Christmas album I don't have, is I don't have Bob Dylan's Christmas in the Heart. And I would like to get that album on my because I do have the CD, but I'm such an asshole about Bob Dylan anyway. But just that there's that song, it's like, uh, Must Be Santa. The song Must Be Santa. I love that. That one song alone kills me. I'm like, this is great. But that's kind of what Dave Alvin reminds me of. He's, he's an old man. He's kind of dressed up like a cowboy. He's got a fucking ascot. And, the, you know, uh, yeah, you never say never, man. No, nope. uh, Megadeth would be even better. Like a Megadeth Christmas album. I would love that, man. I would so get into that. Um, you know, uh, I, 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 never, I didn't buy, I don't think I have a copy of that metal album that uh, Scott Waters produced. Um, I can't remember the name of that band that, he, that I, I would have liked to. The Darkness did a great rock Christmas tune. Nice big riff and lots of bells. I mean, I would love that, you know? I don't pretend to be an expert, not at all, you know? There's many, I'm sure there's many metal Christmas albums that I don't know that I would greatly enjoy. Um, I'll be talking all about Chris, uh, Christmas albums and country albums, just stuff that puts people off. But, you know, I don't... Man, I don't care. You know, you got to be yourself, man. If other people can't hang with it, well, that's not your problem. You know, Duke Pearson, Merry Old Soul. I love this album, too. Chris, one of my favorite Christmas albums. This is a great soulful, soul jazz kind of Christmas album, Merry Old Soul. There's another Christmas album, which is fairly modern. Helix. Yeah, Helix, I think. Yeah, I want to get that, that Helix Christmas album, because I, what I what I listen to, I really like, I really like Scott a lot. I think Scott's a great guy, I really enjoy his channel, and you know, I just like love hanging out with him, and I'm not always like, I don't know all the music that he shows, but he really has like introduced me to a lot, you know, and metal can be kind of like off-putting, you know, and, um, and Scott's just such a great ambassador for that music, I think he's just such a great guy. 
Um, okay. I, 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 this is turning into like basically a Christmas album thing, but I, there's so many of them that I kind of love. James Brown's Christmas. Speaking of Christmas, you got to put up the tree with mom and a new fiance. Well, Merry Christmas to you. You're collecting money for kids in next week's show. What a great fucking guy you are, Mikey Bananas. Merry fucking Christmas. You know what? You're really telling us about the spirit of the thing, Mikey, and I appreciate that, man. You know, and say hi to your mom and say hi to your new fiance. You lucky, lucky bastard. Scott's definitely awesome. Definitely knows his stuff. You know what's so funny? Is Scott said, uh, I remember Scott saying on Facebook that some guy's like, you're not metal, and is like doubting his metal credentials and stuff, and it's like, I think that says everything about metalheads. It's like, here's Scott, this guy who's been like lived and breathed it for like 40 years, who's, you know, always like loved metal and it's just like ate up with metal and there's always going to be some asshole who's like, you're not really metal. Like, man, fuck those motherfuckers. Uh, but anyway, Lou Rawls' Christmas record produced by David Axelrod is one of your favorite Christmas records. Cheap too. Well, they're always cheap. That's one thing I love about Christmas albums is that they're always cheap, you know? Uh, but, yeah, I just had this right here. Here it is. Blue Rawls. In fact, I have multiple copies of this, John. <laughs> it's like you and me, man. We're right there on the same wavelength. But, yeah, Lou Rawls, produced by David Axford. I think I have a stereo and a mono. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, um, it's, you know, I got out my change purse. You took your young girlfriend's tree, tree shopping. It brings the spirit. Richard, <laughs> you're my hero, man. You are my hero. I want to be just like you when I'm very man. Uh, yeah, Lou Rawls, produced by David Axelrod. Killer Christmas album, you know. Very cheap. I mean, these never cost much of anything. That's that's one thing. I, I pick them up during the year and stuff because they're, um, you know, they're not expensive. And I just put them in my vault. I have this big steel uh, am, am, ammunition case. This is the lid. It's like this military ammunition case that fits perfectly record. It weighs about 100 pounds, but I just keep all my Christmas records in there. More like people that aren't metal, even told the same thing, just laugh. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Exactly, you know. I, I, I love metal. I love metal heads. I, I especially love the metal collectors. If you haven't heard this Patti LaBelle album, John, this is right up your alley, man. Right up your alley. I think you would quite enjoy this Patti LaBelle and the Blue Bells. I really like the way she does uh, Christmas albums and stuff, and you know, my wife's African-American and stuff. You know, my, all my in-laws, obviously, are African-American. And um, the way to celebrate Christmas, uh, you know, as a family and stuff, I just really very warm and loving. Uh, that's really what Christmas is all about. The kids are like, I just want to get presents, you know. And, you know, I understand. I was the same way when I was a kid. And, obviously, I still like getting presents and shit. If you gave me a bunch of records at Christmas, I'd be like, bro, fucking, you get the jackpot mofo. You know, but still. Phil Spector Christmas album. But anyway, what I was going to say was Real Spirit Christmas is supposed to be about, you know, loving and being with your family and being together and togetherness and all that shit, you know. That's what it's supposed to be about, you know. Getting out of those cold elements. It's cold, cold world we live in where it's just pumping down that, that nasty white snow, you know, and you get inside by the fireplace, by the family hearth, then you bundle up together, you know, like the cavemen did, man, like animals do, you know, like the bears hibernate in the winter. You get together and you're loving each other and it's like all, you know, warm and like cozy. And you celebrate the fact that you're going to make it through the winter and that, you know, you're not doing so bad and life's okay. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about, bro. Phil Spector, Christmas album. Okay, this is not, this is a re-ish, but again, like, eh, you know, you have to check out the Chet Atkins. You might like that, Ben. You might like the Chet Atkins. I mean, I don't know. Hard to say, man. I mean, but I think you might like it. It's definitely uh, very chill, very chill, you know, very bucolic, you know, so I, I don't know, but for me personally, I'm into it. It's just a reissue. This is cheap. The original uh, Phil Spector Christmas album is a lot of money, but like, you know, like, I, I don't really want to pay a hundred bucks for Christmas album, man. I really don't. Although I'll tell you one that I might pay a hundred bucks for is the Sonics Christmas album. I, I almost would pull the trigger on that because it's so cool, but I just kind of don't really want to do it. But I, I, I almost would, you know, I'm not going to lie. I got like some of the stuff like I just don't know if I showed this or not. I got this signed Swans album. I don't even know who signed it, but one of the, one of the Swans signed it. This was like 10 bucks. Uh, 
the Swans. Kind of a, a group that I sort of haven't always, you know, given a lot of attention to. This is it's like, I'm so ignorant about anything from the 90s, you know, especially heavier stuff from the 90s. Like, considering that that was kind of my thing at the time, but I wasn't like really collecting in the 90s because I just didn't have money for it, you know, couldn't afford it. Uh, hello, Stefan, how are you? Um, the Swans. I mean, they're they're a little bit industrial. They're a little bit digitalized kind of sounding, you know. They're kind of, they're an interesting band. They're definitely an interesting band. Some of their album art can be kind of transgressive and stuff. This is the original Euro pressing. Um, you know, I mean, it's kind of heavy, but to be honest with you, like, what sounds, what used to sound heavy to me doesn't particularly sound super heavy to me anymore. Not, not really. I listened to an old favorite, an old classic rock favorite recently. This week I busted this out and listened to it and, um, God, it's so great. It's just great, man. Uh, it's like, I remember early this summer I was kind of, it was like listening to Deep Purple and I was listening to my old, like, classic rock records and stuff and, and, uh, just really, really enjoy busting this stuff out once in a while. And I'll probably always love this, you know, with the Roger Dean artwork too. So this is like not an expensive record at all, man. You can get these, you get a good copy of that for very little. I don't know if I talked about this already. Don Covey, because I've got a Don Covey record. Uh, so here's the thing, because I do this on Instagram and stuff, I kind of don't remember what I've talked about and what I haven't. I got a Don Covey record, uh, which I have here somewhere, recently uh, at a Goodwill, and it was like, it's like the one Don Covey record that's worth like 70 bucks or something. Uh, I got this. This can be worth like big money, this Don Covey record from the, from the 60s. This is Atlantic Soul record. I found out like, man, that like a good copy of this could sell for like real money, like 70 to to $100, you know? Uh, but his other records are all cheap, so I got these like really cheap. The 90s was definitely a different decade. A lot of the metal bands from the 80s were changing their sound to try to fit in with the grunge, or they just went away. I mean, you know, it's controversial because like a lot of guys who are older than me, because I'm 42, and so I kind of relate to a lot of guys between 42 and 52, but you know, really, I grew up with metal. I grew up with heavy, you know, hair metal and stuff was very popular in the late 80s when I was a kid. But I was born in 77, so 1987 was the first time I was really watching movies and listening to music. And a lot of it hit me really squarely, like Guns N' Roses, Appetite for Destruction, and like the Lost Boys, and uh, the kind of movies that were out, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and uh, uh, Beetlejuice, and... Um, just stuff like that it was that was like the popular zeitgeist of the time, and it really hit me very, very squarely, you know. Be 41 in two weeks. Yeah, I know what you mean. But, I mean, a lot of guys that are older than us, you know, metal was, like, really popular in the 80s. You know, hard rock and metal was super popular, and, you know, that was a little bit before my time. I mean, my cousins listened to Judas Priest. I kind of didn't really get it. I was like, what's up with all the leather and all this shit? Like, what's up with this? I'm like, I didn't really understand it. But now I really like Judas Priest. In fact, listening to Judas Priest, they don't sound heavy to me, really. ACDC doesn't sound the least bit heavy to me. ACDC to me just sounds like a kind of a high-octane blues rock band to me now. You know, but At the time, Aerosmith and ACDC were definitely considered like heavy metal, you know. I, I, I don't think they are, but, you know, <laughs> they, kind of, they kind of were considered that at the time, so I don't know. Uh... Yeah, more kind of instrumental guitar. I know that John, you showed one of these John Fahey Christmas albums. There's, he made more than one, so. Um, I don't file this with my John Fahey, which is tough because I really like John Fahey. I'm super into finger-picking guitar, really into it. In fact, I'm going to make a video about it. Somebody was talking about suggestion, and I was kind of like, this is a good idea because I got this record on, on a Black Friday. I got this Dale Miller finger-picking guitar uh, record, and... It's called Fingers Don't Fail Me Now, and it's on Kicking Mule. And it's kind of like a John Fahey kind of thing, you know? Like, he mixes up, like, blues and ragtime and country finger-picking style, does all this cool stuff. He's an excellent, excellent player. He has this one song that's kind of an inter uh, interesting song called 20-Year-Old Women and 12-Year-Old Scotch, which I'm like, cool name for a song. <laughs> <You know? coughs> but, uh... It has one called Star Trek Blues. So, you know, you're talking, this is the early 70s, you know. 
uh, cheap record. This is like a nothing, you know, two dollar record or whatever. Kind of like these Don Cubby records. The other Don Cubby records this is also on Atlantic, but I mean, this is blues. He's like basically trying to do blues. But recently, I went to the spate where I was really listening to heavy, like a uh, lot of heavy rotation of classic blues records. I was going back and listening to B.B. King and Albert King, and Freddie King, and Lightning and Hopkins, and John Lee Hooker, and Howlin' Wolf, and Muddy Waters, and all the, you know, R.B. Stibbum, and um, uh, Memphis Slim, and Buddy Guy, just all the, all the, all those, all that stuff, you know, really listened to it really heavy there for a while. And this is just not quite that. It, this is just isn't. It's like, almost, but it's just not quite true classic blues. You know, he's got a lot of kind of authenticity but he's just not really as good as he's just not the same thing as like a June uh you know a Lightning Hopkins or something he isn't that being said though like it's still cool it's cool in its own way but it's just not quite authentic classic blues I mean he's really a um he's really a soul artist you know being a guitarist yourself you would say definitely say acoustic and finger picking is the hardest style compared to playing electric well you know, like, I mean, like last night, I mean, I saw a lot of rockabilly guitar playing and stuff. Like I saw, I saw Dave Allen and Dave Alvin and, um, Reverend Horton Heat play last night and, uh, they play really, really well, you know, but, um, I, to be completely honest with you, you know, stone, as much as I love like stone or rock and I love, um, that kind of desert, you know, desert sound, it's like desert rock sound, it's like really like it, a lot of times it just sounds like not that impressive to me I mean I'm just like well hell anybody could play this I mean if you had a fucking Les Paul or an orange amp you know I mean hey hey what's going on what's up Merry Christmas in San Antonio man um yeah I mean like I saw um Matt Pike like last year or whatever I saw uh, not High on Fire but I saw uh, Sleep and it was great, and I really enjoyed it, but you know, if you've been listening to a lot of 80s metal and stuff, you're kind of waiting for somebody to start shredding, and they just never do. It's almost like somebody's playing the rhythm guitar, and it's languid, and it's stony, but like nobody ever starts really shredding. I don't know. I'm just, if you've listened to a lot of 80s metal, that's kind of what it tends to sound like, you know. Another cool Christmas album. I love Jazz Oregon and Christmas, Fred, Fred McGriss Christmas album. Pretty killer Christmas record. I'm getting down to the Christmas wire, man. I mean, it's two weeks now, so I'm going to be hitting it hard, you know. Probably be hitting a lot of Christmas records pretty hard now for a couple weeks. I know, like, nobody cares, but I got this album. This is simultaneously super cool and kind of uncool. This is almost like a Bear Family kind of thing, and in fact, it was recorded in Stuttgart. Um, at the time that these guys were doing this, they were like old middle-aged guys. In fact, I mean, I think that the dyed hair here is actually a farce. I think they were gray by this point. They were dyeing their hair to look a little younger. I mean, they were all 45 to 55 years old in these pictures. And they all knew each other because they had all, like, been on the road together in the 50s and stuff. This is super cool. Really cool. God, I would have loved to have been at this concert. This would have been amazing. And they're, like, the coolest old guys. Have you ever seen the video of the... I think Seth uh, Seth McFarlane makes some of the most interesting TV, and he made this he made this uh, cartoon. It's called uh, Tales from the Tour Bus, and there's some great stuff about like these kind of country guys and the crazy shit they did on the road, like Jerry Lee Lewis, and it was just fantastic. But uh, Seth McFarlane also had a part in this thing I saw recently. It's the Robot Chicken Christmas Special on on cable on Adult Swim on cable TV, which is one of the most interesting channels on TV, in my opinion, Adult Swim, but uh, the Robot Chicken Christmas Special, while it's really short, I thought it was terrific. I like what Seth MacFarlane does, but anyway, I would have loved to have been at this concert <coughs> because these guys are just great, great entertainers, you know, they're just super cool, and they, they all, they had a ton of great songs, and you know, there's great musicianship. Marty Stewart was in the band, and Rodney Crowell was in Johnny Cash's band in the 80s at this time. Um, he had great players with him, you know, he had fantastic players. Nothing wrong with that. You've been keeping Christmas music in your car. You take your nieces to school in the mornings. Well, I mean, 
it's that time of year, man. I mean, you don't have to do it all year. I don't know. I, people, I think Christmas music gets a bad rap. And I think there's just so many fucking people that kind of want you to like, be like, Christmas music sucks, and I'm sick of Christmas. It's like, that. the reason you say that is because you hear the same fucking Mariah Carey song 10,000 times. The radio only plays the same fucking five songs to the point that you're just nauseous when you hear it. And, you know, that's people who aren't trying. But people just, that's the way people are, you know. That's the way people are. Funky Christmas. I've actually had multiple copies of this. Some great, like, funky soul stuff on this. Lou Donaldson's on this and stuff. Luther Vandross, too, and the Impressions and Willis Jackson. Um, you know, you just, you get these records and it's like, why even get rid of them? Really? Like, I got, I got this record in a, uh, in a collection, Mr. Hankey's Christmas Classics. And I was like, oh, there was a bunch of this kind of stuff in there. And I was like, well, I'll sell all this to get my money back for the collection, but why even bother? You might as well just throw it in my Christmas vault. The kids will like it, you know. It's got Mr. Hankey, the Christmas poo. Uh, yeah, from South Park, you know. Anyway, you know, kid stuff, kid stuff. A lot of country Christmas. There's definitely plenty of Christmas music out there to explore, you know. I think we just tend to hear the same old stuff all the time, you know. Uh, this is a bluegrass, you know, newgrass Christmas album, David Grisman's Christmas album. I wouldn't say this is strong throughout. There's definitely some weaker moments on this, but all in all, you know, I quite enjoyed listening to it. Uh, I like David Grisman a lot. Sometimes he kind of takes a turn into an area that I think is a little bit beneath him, because I think he's a great, great musician. But that being said, like, I love what Wonder, just like a other guy he is, you know, when I saw him in concert, I was blown away. I saw him in the 90s after Jerry Garcia died, I was absolutely blown away. I thought he was incredible. The Salsa Orchestra Christmas album, pretty classic salsa Christmas album. John, you probably have this, I'm sure. I don't really find a lot of salsa albums, I really don't. Like, it just does, it's not that common to me. I got this album, I got this Charlie Patton record, the, the third man Charlie Patton record, third man records rather, you know, um, the Detroit label. This is Jack White's label. I love Charlie Patton. I think he's great. And I've been, I was listening to a lot of country, I was listening to a lot of um, blues, classic blues. Unfortunately, the recording quality is so poor and so antiquated. And it was, it was so old from the 30s and stuff uh, that, you know, Charlie Patton is kind of hard to appreciate because it just sounds so muddy and so hissy. Um, he's a great, great artist, but it's just it's tough that a lot of people are going to have trouble getting past that, how bad the sound quality is, because we're such we're used to so much better sound quality. Um, okay, I got a bunch of... Uh, so I got I got this Bluegrass record. Newgrass, really, is what this is. It's J.D. Crow in the New South. A great, great early 70s Bluegrass album. This has been reissued. Uh, this was released on Record Store Day, but this is an original one. Um, it wasn't expensive. It's got Ricky Skaggs, Tony Rice, J.D. Crow. Um, it's just a great, great band. It was John Hartford plays on it a little bit. Um, this is just, this is wonderful, man. This is just great. Really enjoyed this. If you like bluegrass, if you're into that, um, another finger picking uh, style record is uh, "Hard Luck Papa" by Tom Paley. So on that, because I, I bought this uh, Bob Dylan, the World Gone Wrong Bob Dylan album, which I never had on vinyl before, really appreciated it. And he made a lot of reference to the songs Tom Paley used to do. Kind of a folky, you know, but great finger-picking style player. Just knows a million songs. He's got a great knowledge of old catalog songs and stuff. Great old folk songs. Some man magnificent songs. I upgraded my... Uh, some of my Merle Haggard. I bought four Merle Haggard records, like sealed in perfect condition for 20 bucks. I already had this, but this is an upgrade. This is pretty much a perfect copy of this. Um, but honestly, I didn't need it. I think my other copy is also perfect. My other copy might even have a hype sticker and everything. I don't recall, although I love Merle Haggard. absolutely love Merle Haggard. And I often go back to Jen's video of him flipping through all of his Merle Haggard records because he's got like every Merle Haggard record, and I'm a big Merle Haggard fan. But I got this one. I got a couple that I didn't have, like this one. You gotta be a pretty big fan 
of Merle Haggard to really care. You know, this is I Love Dixie Blues. And so he's going to, like, New Orleans. This is live, and he's, like, recording in New Orleans. And, like, if you watch the Merle Haggard, uh, Austin City Limits performance, there's, you know, he still has Bonnie Owens. He tended to retain a lot of elements of his past in his band, and you can hear that influence of the of the New Orleans stuff. I, I just think he's such an interesting guy. He always tried to always tried to add some things in. There's just something about New Orleans style, you know. It's just really distinct. I mean, really, it's not like it's really different than what you would. I mean, it's you know, same kind of country blues, kind of same kind of thing. But they just have a little bit of special something sauce that they put on it in New Orleans. It's it's just really cool. Really love that. He was always kind of a a traditionalist, you know, he was always kind of a, um, a retro like, throwback to a lot of a previous, you know, and I think people really appreciate that about him. This is the album, I don't know if I showed this, it was like talking about the world gone wrong on vinyl. These Columbia reissues, man, they sound great. His guitar playing is incredible. His voice was starting to get real froggy at this point. I don't think this really sold very well on CD at the time. Although it's really quite a great record, this is guitar playing because he's kind of going back to the early stages of his career where he just played acoustic guitar and sang these songs, and he has this offhandedness, like the, the style, like Bob Dylan can really like just offhandedly kind of toss out a song and just kind of rumble, bumble, stumble through it on it the way he picked the guitar. But he's like a masterful guitar picker. But it's like it sounds like it's really. Um, you know, chaotic. Like, it sounds like it's really wild and untamed, you know? I, I, that He kind of... He's just great, man. He's just fucking great. Love him, you know? So, uh, this was a local thing. This band's called Mouth Eater. And uh, I was, this was given to me for free on Black, uh, Black Friday's uh, uh, Record Store Day Black Friday by a guy who is really into heavy music, Mouth Eater, Ornament. And... Uh, this is what it looks like. The, the, the vinyl looks like this. It's kind of like half pink and half gray. And this is very like 90s heavy, heavy rock sounding. Man, this is great. I was listening to this earlier and I, I don't know if this was only like released locally, Mouth Eater, uh, or if they were just here in DC area, but it was great. Anyway, I should probably stop going on long enough. But thank you guys for hanging out and I hope you guys are ready for Christmas and having good holidays and stuff. And I um, hope everything's going well. All right, peace, everybody. Thank you.